What is Hauntology? by Mark Fisher. The concept of hauntology gained its second unlife in the middle of the last decade. Critics were prompted to reach for the term again by a confluence of musical artists, Philip Jack, Burial, the Ghost Box label, the Caretaker. Their work sounded ghostly, certainly, but the spectrality was not a mere question of atmospherics. What defined this hauntological confluence more than anything else was its confrontation with the cultural impasse, the failure of the future. By 2005 or so, it was becoming clear that electronic music could no longer deliver sounds that were futuristic. From the end of World War II up until the 1990s, electronic music, whether produced by high culture composers such as Pierre Schaefer or Karl Heinz Stockhausen, or by synth pop groups and dance music producers, had been synonymous with a sense of the future. So much so that film and television would habitually turn to electronic music when it wanted to invoke the future. But by 2005, electronica was no longer capable of evoking a future that felt strange or dissonant. If electronic music was futuristic, it was in the same sense that fonts are gothic. The futuristic now connoted a settled set of concepts, affects, and associations. 21st century electronic music had failed to progress beyond what had been recorded in the 20th century. Practically anything produced in the 2000s could have been recorded in the 1990s. Electronic music had succumbed to its own inertia and retrospection. It was also clear that this was more than a moment in a familiar pattern in which, as one genre wanes, another emerges to take its place at the leading edge of innovation. There was no leading edge of innovation anymore, and music as elsewhere in culture, we were living, as Franco Berardi suggests, after the future. What haunts the digital cul-de-sacs of the 21st century is not so much the past as all the lost futures that the 20th century taught us to anticipate. The futures that have been lost were more than a matter of musical style. More broadly and more troublingly, the disappearance of the future meant the deterioration of a whole mode of social imagination, the capacity to conceive of a world radically different from the one in which we currently live. It meant the acceptance of a situation in which culture would continue without really changing, and where politics was reduced to the administration of an already established capitalist system. In other words, we were in the end of history described by Francis Fukuyama, Fukuyama's thesis was the other side of Frederick Jameson's claim that postmodernism, characterized by its inability to find forms adequate to the present, still less to anticipate wholly new futures, was the cultural logic of late capitalism. The future is always experienced as a haunting, as a virtuality that already impinges on the present, conditioning expectations and motivating cultural production. What hauntological music mourns is less the failure of a future to transpire, the future as actuality, than the disappearance of this effective virtuality. Leyland James Kirby, the man behind the Caretaker Project, released an album whose title captured perfectly the sense of yearning for a future that we feel cheated out of. Sadly, the future is no longer what it was. Faced with the collapse into a time dominated by pastiche and reiteration, Hauntological music found itself at the heart of a paradox. Could the only opposition to a culture dominated by what Jameson calls the nostalgia mode be a kind of nostalgia for modernism? It is worth returning to some of Jameson's arguments about postmodernism here, especially because film plays such a crucial role in his theorization of this nostalgia mode. Jameson argues that postmodernism is characterized by a particular kind of anachronism. His analysis is nowhere more vivid than in his discussion of Lawrence Costin's Body Heat from 1981. From the outset, Jameson writes in Postmodernism, the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, a whole battery of aesthetic signs begins to distance the officially contemporary image from us in time. The Art Deco scripting of the credits, for example, serves at once to program the spectator to the appropriate nostalgia mode of reception. The setting has been strategically framed with great ingenuity to eschew most of the signals that normally convey the contemporary United States in its multinational era, 
The small town setting allows the camera to elude the high-rise landscape of the 1970s and 80s. While the object world of the present day, artifacts, appliances, whose styling would at once serve to date the image, is elaborately edited out. Everything in the film, therefore, conspires to blur its official contemporary and make it possible for the viewer to receive the narrative as though it were set in some eternal 30s beyond real historical time. What blocks body heat from being a period piece or a nostalgia picture in any straightforward way is its disavowal of any explicit reference to the past. Jameson concludes that Body Heat's anachronism constitutes a waning of historicity, and that this brings home the, the enormity of a situation in which we seem increasingly incapable of fashioning representations of our own current experience. By the 21st century, the kind of pastiche which Jameson discusses was now no longer exceptional. In fact, it had become so taken for granted that it was not liable to be noticed anymore. But while Body Heat edits out artifacts and appliances in order to project us into a time beyond history, what is perhaps more typical of early 21st century Hollywood is the converse case, an obsessive foregrounding of the technological artifacts of the consumer present together with a conspicuous use of digitally enabled technologies such as CGI. Yet this anxious insistence on the paraphernalia of the contemporary obfuscates the fact that formal features of what we are seeing and hearing are familiar to the point of being exhausted. Relentless technological upgrades, the same thing seen and or heard on a new platform, disguise the disappearance of formal innovation and new kinds of sensory experience. How well does this take on hauntology translate into a discussion of cinema and television? As a first approach to this question, we should note that much hauntological music is as much about film and TV as it is about music. The caretaker borrowed his name from the role that Jack Torrance, Jack Nicholson, takes on at the Overlook Hotel in Kubrick's 1980 film The Shining, about which more shortly. In fact, the whole caretaker project was originally motivated by a simple conceit the idea of making a whole album's worth of material that could have been heard in The Overlook. The caretaker subjects 1930s tea room pop to degradation, delay, distortion, rendering it as a series of sweet traces that are veiled by one of Sonic Hauntology's signature traits, the conspicuous use of crackle, which renders time as an audible materiality. Part of the excitement provoked by the Ghost Box label, meanwhile, was the canon of an audiovisual culture from the near past, alluded to stylistically and in sleeve notes, it both revived and made a bid to continue. This mixture of genre film and public service broadcasting included the work of BBC Radiophonic Workshop, whose experimentation with electronics translated music concrete into incidental music in radio and television drama. Nigel Neal's extraordinary BBC TV play, The Stone Tape, 1972, which drew upon T.C. Lethbridge's idea that haunting may be actual recordings of traumatic events, and Anthony Schaefer's The Wicker Man, 1973, with its sui generis condensation of paganism, folk music, and horror. The Britishness of this lineage is no accident. Neither is the fact that most, but by no means all, of the artists that have been described as hauntological are British. The yearnings detectable in much hauntological music were no doubt stirred up by the expectations raised by a public service broadcasting system and a popular culture that could be challenging and experimental. If the conditions for this popular modernism were provided to a large extent by social democracy, Its aspirations were not confined to a hope that social democracy would simply continue. The radical dimension of social democratic culture, in fact, consisted in the way it produced a longing for its self-overcoming. That it was premised on the movement toward a scarcely imaginable future. As Owen Hatherley has argued, bulldozed brutalist buildings are one sign that this future did not arrive. The actual future would not be popular modernism, but populist conservatism, the creative destruction unleashed by the forces of business on the one hand, the return to familiar aesthetic and cultural forms on the other. It would not be British, but American, 
or at least a certain version of the American exemplified in consumer culture. This resurgence of conservatism was interrupted by a new normativity, the demands of the new social movements resulting in an intolerance of sexism, racism, and homophobia. But it now seems that the price of this new normativity was the disintegration of social democracy and of the workers' movement that forced social democracy into existence in the first place. One of the features that haunts those who count themselves as progressive then is the possibility of a culture that could continue what had begun in the post-war social democracy, but that which could leave behind the sexism, racism, and homophobia which were so much a feature of the actual post-war period. To haunt does not mean to be present, and it is necessary to introduce haunting into the very construction of a concept. Jacques Derrida wrote in The Spectres of Marx, The State of the Debt, The Work of Mourning, and The New International. Hauntology was this concept. One of the repeated phrases in Spectres of Marx is from Hamlet, This time is out of joint. And in his recent radical atheism, Derrida and the Time of Life, Martin Hagelin argues that this broken sense of time is crucial not only to hauntology but to Derrida's whole deconstructive project Derrida's aim, Hagelin argues, is to formulate a general ontology, in contrast to the traditional ontology that thinks being in terms of self-identical presence. What is important about the figure of the specter, then, is that it cannot be fully present. It has no being in itself, but marks a relation to what is no longer or not yet. Provisionally, then, we can distinguish two directions in ontology. The first refers to that which is no longer, but which is still effective as a virtuality, the traumatic compulsion to repeat, a structure that repeats, a fatal pattern. The second refers to that which, in actuality, has not yet happened, but which is already effective in the virtual, an attractor, an anticipation shaping current behavior. In addition to being another moment in Derrida's deconstruction, where hauntology would resume the work formerly done by concepts such as the trace de France, Spectres of Marx was also a specific engagement with the immediate historical context provided by the disintegration of the Soviet Empire. Or rather, it was an engagement with the alleged disappearance of history trumpeted by Fukuyama. What would happen now that actually existing socialism had collapsed and capitalism could assume full-spectrum dominance, its claims to global dominion thwarted not any longer by the existence of a whole other bloc, but by small islands of resistance such as Cuba and North Korea. Spectres of Marx was also a series of speculations about the media or post-media technologies that capital had installed on its now global territory. Hauntology was by no means something rarefied. It was accustomed to the time of techno telediscursivity, techno teleiconicity, simulacra, and synthetic images. But this discussion of the tele shows that ontology concerns a crisis of space as well as time. As theorists such as Paul Virilio and Jean Baudrillard have long acknowledged, and Spectres of Marx can also be read as Derrida settling his account with these thinkers, teletechnologies collapse both space and time. Events that are spatially distant become available to audience, audiences instantaneously. Neither Baudrillard nor Derrida would live to see the full effects, no doubt I should say the full effects so far, of the teletechnology that has most radically contracted space and time, the internet, and it is significant that the discourse of hauntology should have been attached to popular culture at the moment when cyberspace enjoyed dominion over the reception, distribution, and consumption of culture, especially music culture. The erosion of spatiality had been amplified by the rise of what Mark Ogg calls the non-place. Airports, retail parks, and chain stores, which resemble one another more than they resemble the particular spaces in which they are located, and whose ominous proliferation is the most visible sign of the implacable spread of ca capitalist globalization. The disappearance of space goes alongside the, the uh, disappearance of time. There are non-times as well as non-places. Haunting can be seen as intrinsically resistant to the contraction and homogenization of time and space, 
It happens when a place is stained by time, or when a particular place becomes the site for an encounter with broken time. What is anachronistic about the ghost story, Jameson wrote in his essay on Kubrick's The Shining, is its peculiarly contingent and constitutive dependence of physical place and, in particular, on the material house as such. The Shining, in fact, anticipates many of the preoccupations that have reemerged in the 21st century take on hauntology. The film refers to hauntology in the most general sense, the quality of dispossession that is proper to human existence as such, the way in which the past has a way of using us to repeat itself. But it also engages with a specific historical crisis, a crisis of historicism itself, that would only intensify in the years since it was released. It is also worth remembering that Kubrick's own work, along with contemporaries such as Coppola and Scorsese, was part of a popular modernism in American cinema that peaked in the 1970s and which was haunted Hollywood ever since. But as something that it seeks to simulate, a simulation that Coppola and Scorsese themselves increasingly found impossible to perform convincingly or exercise, all the better to replace it with mediocre blockbuster spectacle. The Shining was released at a threshold moment in U.S. and U.K. history, when neoliberalism and neoconservatism had just taken over, and the Fordist organization of the industrial production was ebbing away in favor of a more precarious and, what some have said, immaterial form of labor. The architecture of the Overlook Hotel reflects this threshold, the bland office in which Jack meets the manager, as multinational and standardized as a bedroom community or a motel chain, according to Jameson, looks forward to the non-places of coming corporate hyperdomination, while the rest of the hotel looks back to the repressed specters of American history, organized crime, atrocity, and the extermination of Native Americans. When anachronism is blurred in something like body heat, it is staged in The Shining. This anachronism, this experience of a time that is out of joint, is in fact the very subject of the film. Many of the film's most unnerving moments, Jack confronting his ostensible predecessor Delbert Grady in the bathroom and reminding him of actions that he has no recollection of performing, Jack himself smiling from the center of a photograph taken in the 1920s, derive from the foregrounding of anachronism. And what is the Overlook Hotel? where one door can lead into a ballroom, endlessly plain, dreamy, delirious 1920s pop, and another can reveal a moldering corpse, whose corridors extend in time as well as space, if not a kind of architecture of anachronism? This can be heard in its soundtrack, which conflates the pre-war crooning of Al Boley with the electronica of Wendy Carlos, as much as it can be seen in all the revenants from earlier moments in the hotel's history that menace and seduce Jack. Given Derrida's emphasis on the various teletechnologies, it is significant that The Shining is about telepathy as well as haunting. The telepathic sensitivities of Jack and his son Danny, it is suggested, are what the malevolent forces in the hotel use to manifest themselves, a concept which perhaps reflects anxieties about the action at a distance, which is the form that contemporary power increasingly assumes. The Shining was part of a rash of films about telepathy in this period, in addition to Carrie in 1976, and there was De Palma's The Fury in 1978, and Cronenberg's Scanners in 1981. Hauntology itself can be thought of as fundamentally about forces which act at a distance, that which, to use Slavoj Žižek's distinction, insists has casual effects without physically existing. One of the novelties of The Shining is the way it connects an older concept of the ghost story with the psychoanalytic emphasis on the agency of the past. All of the ambivalences of Jack's role as the Overlook's hotel caretaker are relevant here. Jack is the one who takes care, but also one who lacks any agency of his own, insofar as he belongs to the hotel. He exists only in a caretaker capacity, as one who merely ensures that the past, the obscene, homicidal underside of patriarchy, will keep repeating. The Overlook itself can be seen as an example of what Reza Negaristani, in his book Cyclonopedia, Complicity with Autonomous Materials, calls inorganic demons or xenolithic artifacts, 
These relics of, or artifacts are generally depicted in the shape of objects made of inorganic materials, stone, metal, bones, souls, ashes, etc. Autonomous, sentient, and independent of human will, their existence is characterized by their forsaken status, their immemorial slumber, and their provocatively exquisite forms. Inorganic demons are parasitic by nature. They generate their effects out of the human host, whether as an individual, an, an ethnicity, a society, or an entire civilization. Neuristani could also be describing here a cluster of British films and television programs made between the 1950s and the 70s. The fiction of M.R. James, Neil, and Alan Garner is fixated on the encounter with such inorganic demons. In specific, hauntological landscapes, landscapes stained by time, where time can only be experienced as broken as a fatal repetition. To consider the films and television programs based on these writers' work, now is to be caught up in a hauntology that is, at least, double. For these works were hauntological in the sense that, like The Shining, they were about the virtual agency of the no longer. In this, they constitute a kind of pulp modernist answer to Freud's psychoanalysis and to the attempt to recover lost time in the literary experimentations of Proust and Joyce. Yet this kind of public service of broadcasting, and the broader popular modernist culture of which it was a part, itself now belongs to the no longer. There is a special charge to be had from disinterring these works in which time is out of joint in our current dehistoricized end-of-history moment. It was James who established the template that the other writers, consciously or not, would follow. James's O oh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, originally published in 1904, was adapted as Whistle and I'll Come to You for the BBC by Jonathan Miller in 1968, and A Warning to the Curious in 1922 was adapted by Lawrence Gordon Clark in 1972. Both have just been reissued on DVD by BFI Video. In both stories, an urban interloper into the East Anglian countryside disinters a xenolithic artifact, an old whistle, a crown, that calls up ancient, vengeful forces. The BBC adaptations are remarkable for their attention to place. The camera lingers on the eerily empty Norfolk and Suffolk landscapes, which become in many ways the most significant agency in the television films. Nigel Neal's masterpiece, Quartermass in the Pit, a originally a BBC serial in 1958, remade as a superior film by Hammer Studios in 1967, in effect blew this narrative structure up to cosmic proportions. Here, it is London, and more specifically, the fictional London underground station Hobbs End, which is the site of, for the encounter with a xenolithic artifact, a Martian spacecraft. The spacecraft exerts influence te telepathically, and Quartermass in the Pit amounts to nothing less than a retelling of human history. Phenomena that seemed to be supernatural through the ages are explained as, in as encounters with the Martian travelers who, in a twist that anticipates the recent Prometheus, interbred with apes in order to produce the human species as we now know it. The xenolithic artifact triggers a traumatic, deeply suppressed race memory of these alien origins. Garner is the third figure in this triumvirate. His two novels, The Owl Service and Redshift, are about mythical structures that repeat by parasiting the energy of adolescence. Both no novels center on relics. In The Owl Service, a dinner service decorated with an owl pattern, and Redshift, a spearhead. Both are also new versions of myths. The Owl Service is an updating of the story of Bloodwed from the collection of ancient Welsh folk tables, the Mabinon. Redshift is a take on the Tamlin legend about a boy abducted by fairies who is ultimately saved by his true love. Both are also about particular landscapes, Wales and Cheshire, and the suggestion is that it is the combination of artifact, landscape, adolescence, and mythic structure that potentiates the fatal repetitions which the novels track. Both were also adapted for television, The Owl Service by Granada in 1969, and Redshift for BBC's Play for Today in 1978. Redshift was supposedly inspired by some cryptic graffiti that Garner saw. Not really now, not anymore. This immensely suggestive phrase, Garner's version of The Time is Out of Joint, captures what is at stake in so much of the present discussion of hauntology.
not really now, not anymore, points out the postmodern impasse, the disappearance of the present and the possibility of representing the present. But it also points to an alternative temporality, another way in which time can be out of joint, a mode of ca causality that is about influence and virtuality rather than gross material force. What is hauntology now? Channel 4's remarkable 2009 adaptations of David Peace's Red Riding novels constituted a kind of hauntological return to a model of public broadcasting supposedly made obsolete by neoliberalism. Peace's novels were a disinterring of the 1970s. The fascination with this period over the last few years, as it has transformed from an object of memory into historical narrative via kitschy retro, is no doubt due in part to the fact that it was the decade when, in the UK, social democracy fell into terminal decline, and neoliberalism's shock doctrine prepared the way for the total reconstruction of social life. We see the shadow of this near future in the first of the televised trilogy, 1974, when Sean Bean's architect unveils the plans for a shopping mall, which will mean that there is no need to fuck off home, a perfect summary of the way in which the non-places of consumerism will also eliminate time. The surface subject of Peace's novels, Police Corruption and Incompetence, The Crimes of the Yorkshire Ripper, rests upon his deeper fascination with the intersection of place and period. By contrast, with the soft, focused kitsch of something like the BBC's Life on Mars series, in which police violence becomes one more wistfully evoked signifier of a longingly re remembered past, the 1970s appears here as a cursed period, just as Yorkshire becomes a cursed territory. One of the main failings of Tom Hooper's disastrous 2009 adaptation of pieces The Damned United is its refusal to engage with this question of territoriality. And what is a curse, if not a form of hauntology? The work of John Acumfra and the Black Audio Film Collective touch on similar haunted territory. When the BAFC's 1986 Hansworth Sons was shown at the Tate Modern in the wake of the English riots in the summer of 2011, Acumfra posed a question about hauntological causality. What is it about certain places such as Tottenham which means that riots keep happening? How, when the whole population of an area has changed, do such repetitions occur. Hansworth songs can be read as a study of hauntology, of the specter of race itself, an effective virtuality if ever there was one, an account of how the traumas of migration, forced and otherwise, play themselves out over generations, but also about the possibilities of rebellion and escape. Its experimental, essayistic form driven in no small part by Trevor Matheson's and empathic sound design as by the images, meant that it could be in some respects considered the culmination of popular modernism in British public broadcasting. Hansworth Sons was made for Channel 4, but it is impossible to imagine it being commissioned by any UK public broadcaster now. With its sampling of archive sources such as BBC Radio's production of Under Milkwood and documentary images of Caribbean immigrants arriving in Britain, a comfort's recent The Nine Muses was in part a requiem for this lost era of popular modernism. Patrick Keeler's Robinson trilogy offers a different take on hauntology and landscape. In one respect, the Robinson films can be seen as a study of the rise of post-Fordist England, the England Kyler sees rising from the wreckage of industrialism is a deterritorialized zone, a non-place that is sinister in its very anonymity. Yet, in their return to sites of martyrdom and antagonism, Robinson in Ruins 2010, for instance, touches upon Greenham Common and the woodland where scientist David Kelly was found dead. The film's attempt to counter neoliberal erasure of history, prompting us to speculate on what might have been, or to contemplate how the struggles of whose sites the camera captures could be revived. Chris Petit's content, 2010, is like Kyler's films, an anatomy of the non-places of post-Fordist Britain. His camera capturing the prosaic sheds that are the first buildings of a new age, and a study of the disappearance of time and space themselves in the ether of cyberspatial communication. But it is also a stirring up of some of the potentials that late capitalism has closed off. Like Petit's first film, Radio On, released in that threshold year, 1979, content dreams of a different kind of British film, 
one that has more in common with the European art cinema than with the dreary heritage industry kitsch that came to dominate cinema in the UK. Like the Red Riding Trilogy content, which was first broadcast on Channel 4's spinoff channel, More 4, seemed incongruous when it was aired, as if it did not belong in contemporary broadcasting at all. In one sense, a throwback to older public service broadcasting and experimental cinema, the film was in fact more like a flare from a future that did not arrive in a country that, after 1979, as Petit puts it in content, was reversing into a tomorrow based on a non-existent past.